Here we are with lecture six, personal hygiene and training. So the aim of lecture six is to provide an understanding of the need for high standards of personal hygiene and the knowledge to control and monitor staff. And learning outcomes, by the end of this module, you will be able to define the role of management in securing high standards of personal hygiene and preventing contamination of food, and also the role of supervisory staff in securing high standards of personal hygiene. Statewide training is so important. Identify what to look out for with medical screening of staff and give reasons why protect clothing is so important. So let's have a look at the staff selection for food handlers. Uh, first of all, they should be clean and have a tidy appearance. There should be absence of any skin infection. They must have clean hands, short fingernails, no signs of nail biting, absence of excessive jewellery and makeup, a belief in the importance of hygiene, willing to attend food safety training. Food handlers are, or well, let's have a look at the sources and causes of hazards with food handlers rather, contaminated hands. And I've already mentioned this, but the hands are the biggest source of cross contamination in the kitchen. Food handlers, ill, especially diarrhea and vomiting. Boils and septic cuts, cuts and abrasions, poor hygiene, contaminated clothing, jewellery. Effective hand washing. Now, what I've got here, I've got uh, two different colour sections. Uh, the red section really is when you must, or it's most important, to wash your hands thoroughly. Uh, because uh, your hands in any of these uh, conditions will be um, highly infected. Uh, they'll have contamination on them. And what I'll talk about in a second is uh, for this, uh, for the red area, is use a double hand wash system. Uh, for the black, or the ones in black, use a single hand wash system. So the main times when you must wash your hands, uh, especially by the double hand wash system, is once you've entered the food room, after visiting the toilet, changing a dressing or a plaster, cleaning up dog dirt or any other faecal contamination, for example, handling a soiled nappy, dealing with an ill person, and after handling raw food. Other occasions when you must wash your hands, but no need to be so uh, rigorous uh, because your hands are not as heavily contaminated as in the red area, uh, touching your hair, nose or face, smoking, eating, coughing, sneezing or blowing the nose, cleaning, handling waste material, handling money and handling external packaging. Hand washing, the role of the supervisor. Instruction, demonstration and supervision. Lead by example. Ensure facilities are available. Spot checks. So these are the sort of things a supervisor must be undertaking to ensure that the hand washing is uh, being undertaken by the food handlers and members of staff. Uh, this is not a very plain slide, but this is an example of safe hand washing. Uh, there are eight steps. Uh, firstly, start with wet hands and a nail brush, uh, preferably with soft nylon filaments uh, made of material other than wood for the backing material. Uh, so uh, this area here, for example, again made of a plastic substance. Uh, if you use wood, it'll absorb water and obviously can uh, hold bacteria. So we start with uh, wet hands and the brush. Uh, we need to put a bit of soap on the brush, as in number two. Now, the temperature of the water is irrelevant. Uh, we're not looking at killing bacteria with the temperature of the water. It's just there for comfort purposes. So, warm water. You don't want it freezing cold. So, you want to, want to wash your hands. And you don't want to boil it out because you're going to scald your hands. So, you put some liquid soap onto the brush. Uh, liquid soap is the preferred option. It should be just plain soap, pH neutral. Uh, not containing any bactericides. Um, if you do start using any chemicals such as bactericides, alcoholic gels, then it will um, cause the bacteria present 
uh, to become stronger. Uh, they'll actually um, grow an immunity to the chemicals, so they'll be more difficult to get rid of. Now, this is where we end up with uh, very strong mutations, or superbugs as we call them. So just only soap and water. We're not looking at killing the bacteria. We're looking at just washing them away, washing them into the water system. So you build up uh, a lather on the soap brush, sorry, on the brush with the soap, Number three, brush and lather the backs and the fronts of the nails. Then you rinse under the water, and this water's running all the time. And actually the water's running into a sink without a stopper, so it goes straight through. Then we wash our hands, so we put soap in our hands. Uh, we build up a lather, the backs and the fronts of the hands for number six. Then we rinse the hands off for number seven. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, where we need to do a double hand wash system, after you rinse them at number seven, you go back to number one and you do the whole cycle again. Then, after the double hand wash system, you get to number eight, which you need to dry your hands. And towels, paper towels, uh, preferably coloured, are the preferred option to other things like roller towels of material, which is quite easily to cause cross contamination, especially if the towel jams or if people don't pull the towel down after using. And also if you use electric air dryers, uh, they're not environmentally friendly. And you will get a lot of aerosolized uh, spray, which you won't be able to see, coming from the air dryers and actually floating into the environment. So you've got um, bacterial contamination floating about. When you towel dry, you just wipe your hands, you throw it away, it's disposable. And it is more environmentally friendly than using electric air dryers. So protective clothing, what are the properties of protective clothing? Well, they must be clean, washable, light colored, so you can see any stains or any dirt that might be there. Uh, no pockets, so uh, the food handler is not tempted to put any uh, items in the pockets which can end up as physical contamination. Press studs or zipped rather than buttons, again buttons could end up as physical contaminants. Velcro, uh, another method of uh, fastening two parts of the uniform together. It must be in good repair. Laundered in a house, preferably, not taken home, where it could uh, pick up contamination um, from home back to work, for example. And it needs to cover ordinary clothing likely to contact food. You need to wear head covering and or hairnet where appropriate, although it seems to be the case with a lot of food establishments uh, where that I've visited lately, uh, they don't wear any head coverings at all. That's fine if you don't mind any sort of flaking skin, dandruff, psoriasis, eczema or hair falling into your food, but I prefer to receive my food where the food handlers are wearing head coverings. And uh, let's go on to the next one, it should protect food from the risk of contamination. And when should protective clothing be removed? Uh, obviously, when you don't come into contact with food. Um, it should be removed after um, it's dirty, it's been used um, at the end of each shift, or if you get some spillages on you, then you need to um, remove it then. Notification on exclusion. Uh, you need to make sure that staff fill out a medical questionnaire uh, if they've been ill. Uh, exclusion, you must not let them back into the, the working area if they are suffering from or have suffered from diarrhea, vomiting or any foodborne disease. If they've been ill whilst abroad and are still ill, um, or in fact the illness is cleared up, they could well be a carrier. If they've eaten any suspect food, um, in other words they've gone to a, a party, um, they've eaten the same food as everyone else, They've been okay, but everybody else has come down with food poisoning. Again, it could well be their carrier. If they have any septic cuts and boils, if they uh, harbour any serious colds and flu, obviously that could promote coughing and sneezing, and if there's any illness in the family. And the action by the supervisor should be to make sure they are excluded. The DH guidelines recommend 48 hours symptom-free uh, for most uh, food poisoning um, symptoms, although some there are different recommendations, say for hepatitis A. 
and uh, the criteria for return to work. Uh, this is covered in the notes that are supplied with the course. So the course material, which you've downloaded at the beginning of the course, it'll give you a bit more information there. And the objectives and benefits of hygiene training. The objectives are to change attitudes to hygiene positively and to reduce risks. The benefits include safe food, reduce or reduction of wastage, reduction of complaints, increased job satisfaction, increased productivity, correct procedures uh, being adopted uh, while handling food, uh, following the legal requirements, good company image, uh, good management skills, and a reduction in supervision. Uh, the legal requirements for hygiene training Supervision and instruction and or hygiene training must be commensurate with their work activities. In other words, you don't overtrain somebody, you don't undertrain them. Depending on their duties as a food handler, that is the hygiene training they must receive. Training methods include on the job instruction, in house or external courses, and computer based training, which this is an example of. Reinforcement, demonstrations, group exercises, role playing or quizzes. Training aids include books, visios, CD ROMs, posters, acetates, and interactive training packages. For example, Spot the Fault. So we can use the acronym EDIT uh, for training, where you need to explain, demonstrate, involve the food handlers and then test them to make sure they've understood what is being explained and demonstrated to them. So training could be always wear clean protective clothing, which provides knowledge, and this underpins competency. And it's all about competency, not certification. Although the environmental health practitioners, um, environmental health agencies, would obviously prefer to see that you are uh, certificated. It is all about competency, competency at the end of the day. And a training program, and I'll just put these down here quickly, where we've got management of training program, establishing training committee, content of training program, organization of sessions, facilities, Pilot, implement, evaluate, and reinforce them. This is all part of um, an all encompassing training program for food handlers. And again, more details of these elements are included in the downloadable notes that come with this uh, course. So you start with the training program, uh, the induction, which raises awareness. Um, then after awareness, you need to go on to the different levels. Level 2, level 3, level 4. Level 2 uh, is really the um, underlying foundation uh, level, which all food handlers should have, regardless of uh, what job they're doing in the kitchen. Level 3 is really for super supervisors, people who supervise other staff, uh, sous chefs, for example, head chefs. And level 4 is for management, uh, for potential managers, training managers, um, higher supervisors in the kitchen and owners of businesses as well and people who, who wish to train food hygiene would need a level 4 qualification. On the job instruction, uh, that's very good as uh, work progresses. Uh, again, it's just uh, something that uh, you can add to the training programme as well as the official certificated uh, training. Uh, reinforcement, again this needs to be done regularly with the staff. Uh, refreshers should be done every year, uh, especially with the food handlers at level 2, to make sure they're still aware of the uh, current legislation and methods of working. Uh, prerequisites to successful training includes the culture of the organisation, the support of the hierarchy including the chief executive directors, uh, commitment of managers and supervisors, 
and there must be adequate resources, uh, for example, hand wash basins and time to wash hands. And training is part of a hygiene policy. Um, it shows that the high standards of hygiene are being implemented. It shows us in the hygiene policy what company standards must be set. The dangerous practices must be spelled out. Legal obligations must be outlined. There must be a, a commitment to train staff, as I mentioned earlier, by all involved, especially the hierarchy. And there must be a change of, in attitudes. In fact, um, where there's uh, a good training program on in the business, you will get a change in attitudes of the staff. So the problems uh, with training uh, as part of hygiene policy might well be the lack of finance for training, lack of expertise, and the lack of motivation. So the key points of that section, uh, most people carry food poisoning organisms from time to time. The role of management is securing high standards of personal hygiene and preventing contamination of food, as is supervisors as well. Uh, we looked at the characteristics of protective clothing. Training should result in competency. Planned training is essential, so use the training programme and training records must be maintained. These are actually part of the HACCP of uh, food business. The legal requirements related to personal hygiene and training must also be understood and um, brought into the training. Staff selection, we looked at the importance of medical screening and exclusion. And we looked at the awareness of the requirements of the Department of Health guidelines food handlers fitness to work again uh, please read up in the supplied notes because there is more detail there of the department of health guidelines <laughs>